Okay, Jair, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I want to say what a pleasure it is again to speak to so many friends and see so many friends uh, in this group. I can't see everyone, but I recognize so many. Claudia, Carmen, Eclusa, uh, Jair, uh, it's wonderful to be with all of you. Um, um, I'm sorry I will not be able to speak in Portuguese um, and I will try and uh, hope that you, many of you, most of you will be able to uh, appreciate my, my, my talk today. I want to say about where I am. I'm actually joining you from India. Uh, I have been here now uh, locked down for now six months. I could not get back to Boston in March because Harvard Medical School closed. Um, and it will remain closed now till January. Um, so uh, everything we do at Harvard has become remote. Um, everything is on Zoom, including all teaching. Obviously not medical care, but all teaching is now on Zoom. And, uh, and that is why I'm still actually still in India uh, right now for this uh, webinar. Uh, friends, uh, what I will want to do today is to think about how some of the science on effective mental health care that has come from some of the poorest countries in the world might change the way we think about mental health care in the context of COVID-19 and uh, what COVID-19 threatens uh, the world in particular in terms of what I consider another pandemic, not the pandemic of the virus, uh, but the pandemic of mental health problems, particularly depression, suicide, and substance use in the coming years. We all live in countries that have done very badly with COVID-19, um, Brazil, India, and China, and the US, worst performers in the world. Um, I don't know if that's a good club to be part of, um, but I think it's something that all three countries share in terms of what we need to be doing very urgently uh, in the months and years ahead to prevent there being a huge uh, pandemic of mental health problems. And I believe that the solutions that we need to be thinking about lie outside our traditional way of thinking about mental health care. And to do that, I want to first start by um, uh, just introducing to you the subject, the discipline that I am very much associated with, which is global health. Global health is a discipline uh, which I'm gonna, I, I think there's quite a few people who are waiting to join and I, um, and I don't know whether uh, uh, Jair, somebody else is admitting people, but I'm, I'm going to now remove this window or put it on the side there. So um, I don't have to uh, try and manage it. Um, so yeah, it's, the waiting room is in my command. Maybe somebody else can manage the waiting room. Uh, Okay, will someone else manage the waiting room? Okay, so global health um, is a relatively new discipline. Uh, it was only, you know, formally de uh, uh, defined actually in um, 2009, only 10 years ago. But it's something we all understand. We don't need the name global health to understand what it is that this particular discipline is seeking to do. And that is to make sure that healthcare and health outcomes are fairly distributed in the population. All of us in Brazil, in the US and India, and I'll keep drawing these three countries together, not only because COVID-19 has affected these three countries the worst, but also these three countries share something else in common. And that is huge disparities, huge inequalities within each of our countries, which means that healthcare, the quality, and the burden of health problems are not evenly distributed in the population. All our countries have inequalities to do with uh, income, and there are specific other kinds of inequalities, for example, in the US to do with race, in India to do with caste, and I guess in Brazil also, there will be inequalities to do with race. And so the idea of global health is really grounded in the idea of justice. The idea that no one should have a poorer health experience or outcome purely because of a social determinant, like their wealth status or their race. And that there are things that we need to research and do in clinical care and the way we organize healthcare that helps to reduce those inequalities. 
And that is, a, that is really the foundation of global health. And my own area of work has been to think of how we address inequalities, particularly in mental health care. And in particular, how can we improve access to quality mental health care for poor people in poor communities in places where there are very few mental health resources? Now, I want to fall the challenge that we face. And before I think of the challenge to do with COVID-19, let us examine what the world looked like before COVID-19, what the world looked like last year before everything changed so dramatically. Let's start by looking at something that reminds us of why mental health conditions, including substance use disorders, are a rising cause of concern in all countries of the world. This chart coming from the global burden of disease shows you the relative proportion of the burden of disease in different countries organized in terms of their social, uh, the sustainable development index. This is what SDI stands for. I think um, Brazil will probably be a high middle SDI. So this purple bar may represent the group of countries which Brazil is part of. India would represent low middle SDI or low SDI, which is somewhere here. And the US would represent high SDI, which is here, the red bar. What you can see is that no matter which country you live in, no matter what the development status of that country is, over the last 25 years, there has been a gradual increase in the relative proportion of the burden that is due to mental and substance use disorders. It is actually around 50%. The relative proportion of the burden of disease that is due to mental health and substance use condition has gone up by 50% in the last 25 years. Now, those of you, of you who are epidemiologists would know that this does not mean the prevalence has gone up by 50%. What it really means is that the share of the total pie of sickness and suffering and death in countries uh, that is due to mental and substance use condition has gone up. And there are many reasons for that. For example, many countries have done very well in controlling other health conditions, like, for example, maternal and child health conditions, certain infectious diseases, and also certain chronic diseases like heart disease. We've done very badly with mental health problems. But the other very important reason is to do with demographic changes. And that is visible on this slide. On this slide, what you can see is that mental health problems are not evenly distributed across the life course. Instead, they tend to occur in this bulge during young adulthood, between the ages of 15 and 45. And in all these countries in the world, especially with, with some exceptions like Japan and so on, there has been a huge movement of the baby boomer generation into young adulthood in the last 25 years. And it is because of this rapid growth in the population of young adults in the world that we are seeing also a surge of mental health problems in the world because the, entry of this large numbers of people in the at-risk uh, uh, age groups uh, also is driving the increase in burden. In other words, there's a real increase as well in terms of the incidence and therefore the prevalence of mental health problems. Now, DALI's uh, you know, burden of disease, I'll be honest with you, most people don't really understand what that is. It's a very complex metric of the burden of ill health. A metric which most people understand is death. This is a traditional metric um, and has often been a very important uh, metric that is used for priority setting. Now, if you look at the global burden of disease and look at the number of deaths that are attributed directly to mental and substance use conditions every year, it's a very small number. This is from 2016. And you'll see that less than, um, this is 838,000 deaths. It's not even a million deaths every year in the world are attributed specifically to mental and substance use disorders. Now that's not surprising if you consider that suicide is not counted in this. And it is because of the peculiar way in which diseases are classified in ICD, the World Health Organization classification. 
suicide is counted as an injury related cause of death and so therefore suicide does not contribute to mental health similarly if you have cirrhosis of the liver because you drink very heavily the cause of death is counted under liver disease and so the question really to ask is what would be the number of deaths that occur every year in the world that would not have occurred if we did not have depression if we did not have substance use disorders and so on and we invited the global burden of disease uh, a, a group to calculate what we call excess deaths that occur because of mental and substance use conditions and that total number is more than 13 million every year which makes these conditions actually a very important cause of death uh, mortality it's important i specify this because in many parts of the world for example the world bank the most important drivers of financing healthcare are mortality and so it's really important to have mortality data as well uh, uh, that are clearly expressed now the next important issue is are mental health problems associated with social disadvantage and the answer of course we all know as mental health uh, researchers and practitioners the answer is yes but for very long people have often had this idea that mental health problems are rich people's problems in india for example it was often thought that mental health problems are associated with wealth with living in big cities with being uh, able to take care of all our other social livelihood concerns but of course we know that poverty and social disadvantage in all its different forms are strongly associated with poor mental health through all these different pathways and mechanisms that you can see here but what's also very important is that when one has a mental health problem we now have very strong evidence that you can actually slide into poverty because of all these different mechanisms especially i would want to emphasize poor quality care most poor people with mental health problems are unable to access good quality mental health care as a result they often have to seek care from many different providers in many countries that includes traditional medical providers who are also quite expensive in many places they also face problems with employment and reduced productivity and for all of these reasons there is a greater uh, risk of falling into poverty because of mental health problems so you have this classic vicious cycle that you often see for conditions like tb uh, uh, maternal health issues and this is a very important driver of funding financing for healthcare within countries and also globally so we know what the challenge is in terms of burden these are common conditions they are enormously burdensome they are associated with a huge amount of premature mortality and they're associated with poverty and social disadvantage the next important challenge is to ask the question how well is the world faring when it comes to access to minimally effective treatment for mental health problems and here i want to show you the results of systematic reviews that have looked at the coverage of minimally effective treatment for the three leading mental health related uh, causes of the burden of disease mood disorders anxiety disorders and substance use disorders mostly uh, substance use disorders are really alcohol uh, use disorders and i'm going to show you the results of the coverage rates for developing countries low and middle income countries like brazil and india um, first and then for high income countries like the us and western europe next so here you can see the coverage rates um, for developing countries and what this tells you is that more than 95% of people and of course this is an aggregate and there are huge variations between countries uh, like brazil i'm sure does much better than rwanda but there is also a huge disparity within countries in very large countries like brazil you will see huge differences from the northeast compared to the southeast for example but if we were to take an average this is what the result looks like you know more than 90% of people in these countries do not receive minimally effective treatment for these conditions it's astonishing 
I don't think you will find any other health condition for which we do so badly. And this, of course, is partly explaining why the burden of mental health conditions, the relative burden, has been increasing over the last 25 years. Now, let's look at rich countries. The US, for example, has about 10,000 times more resources when it comes to beds per capita, when it comes to psychiatrists and psychologists per capita, uh, and also, of course, when it comes to the amount of money that is being spent per capita on mental health care. How well do these countries do in terms of coverage rates? And this, this is a paper uh, from Graham Thorny Crofts Group, and this is what we find in the richest countries of the world. Of course, it's a lot better than low and middle income countries. It's much better, but it's nowhere near what one should expect for the richest countries of the world. If I had to show you a similar graph, say for diabetes, you would find that the rates would be hovering between 75 and 95%. In other words, even the richest countries in the world, which spend so much more on mental health care, there is still a fairly low coverage of minimally effective treatment. And I want to make this point, and I want to emphasize this point, because it suggests that the solution to very poor quality mental health care is not only more money. There also needs to be a way to think about how we organize and deliver mental health care uh, that we need to attend to. And I'll come back to this point uh, a, a little later in my talk. Now, when people do get mental health care, I suspect you haven't seen images like this in Brazil for maybe 30 years, but this is what mental health care often looks like for people particularly with serious mental illness in many parts of the world. These are pictures taken of mental hospitals in the last 10 years. This is in Serbia, uh, this is in India, um, this is in Indonesia, and this is in Chad. And these are essentially so-called hospitals for people with mental illness. Uh, obviously, you will recognize that these are uh, the sorts of asylum-like pictures. That, you know, as I said, you probably don't see them in Brazil anymore. But unfortunately, this is still where a lot of mental health care is focused in many parts of the world. In India, for example, 80%, 80% of all psychiatric inpatient beds are in hospitals like this, which were built by the British during the colonial years. In Africa, it's almost 95%. Nine out of all 10 psychiatric beds in sub-Saharan Africa are in asylums. And so this is a really huge challenge in terms of uh, mental health care, because obviously, if all the money you spend on mental health care goes into these kinds of hospitals, you know, this is not the kind of place anybody would want to send their loved ones when they're sick. My uh, colleague Arthur Kleinman in my department in Harvard Medical School wrote a very moving piece in the Lancet Medical Journal a few years ago where he described this situation as a fundamental failure of humanity. Now, before people think this is only happening in poor countries, let me be, uh, assure you that the other country that I live in, the US, uh, it also does pretty badly when it comes to serious mental illness. Uh, you know, in the US, we have, don't have those horrible pictures that you can see of asylums. But what we've done is we've simply replaced the asylum with the prison. Uh, and I'd love to hear afterwards, you know, what the situation in Brazil is. Um, so I, I don't know enough about how, uh, you know, prisons perform in, 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 in asylums, what, what the situation in Brazil is. But in the U.S., um, it's an incredible statistic, isn't it, that in 44 states of, out of 50, there are more people with serious mental illness in a prison than in any hospital. And so all that we've done is we've simply replaced the, 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 the bars of the, of the hospital ward uh, with the real bars uh, of, of a prison cell. Now, this was the situation before COVID-19. What is the situation going to be like going forward? Again, I can only speak from the countries I know best, the US and India. There is an economic catastrophe in the US and India. And again, I'd love to hear what the situation in Brazil is. I only read the news about the epidemic in Brazil, which I know is very bad. I, I don't know what the economic situation is in Brazil. But in India and the US, we have seen the largest growth in unemployment and the greatest fall in the economic per capita 
development ever recorded in history. This is not just com you know compared to the any other. It's, it's never been as bad in recorded history. It is estimated that in India alone, 400 million people have seen their livelihoods been destroyed and sliding into poverty. And in the US, we now have the largest number of unemployed people on the unemployment register in recorded history. And of course, in the US, on top of that, you have many other problems. And I'm sure many of you will have been following the harrowing uh, uh, political and social uh, breakdown that we see in the US uh, related to racism uh, and, and upcoming elections. So there's a huge amount of anxiety and distress. Just yesterday, um, I was on a call uh, with my colleagues in a variety of different American uh, organizations looking at the data on mental health uh, reported uh, by US populations. Uh, and we're looking at rates of clinical depression that are already reaching a third of the general population. Not just I'm feeling miserable. No, actually having rates reported on, on um, validated screening questionnaires that put people well above the clinical threshold. Now, I don't know how many of you have been following the dramatic work and superb work of Angus Deaton. He is a Nobel Prize winning economist from Princeton University. Um, but completely by coincidence, he would not have known that this work of his would become so relevant today. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize actually for studying why mortality in America began to plateau and even fall, particularly for working age Americans after 2008. And his incredible work was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, but also led him to a Nobel Prize, was is summarized in this book in which he describes the increased mortality as deaths of despair. And he, he really, you, the word despair is really important here because despair is not the death of hunger. These are not people who are dying like people in India will be dying because they have no food. These are people with homes. These are people with cars. These are people who live in you know, suburban areas of the US. These are people who are dying because they have lost hope for a future for themselves and their families. And the cause of death is primarily suicide and substance use. And of course, again, all of you will know the horrific story of the opioid epidemic in the US. And that opioid epidemic, as we, we, we go deeper into it, we realize that people were turning to drugs largely because of psychogenic despair, uh, which was responding to narcotic uh, 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 pain relief much better than to any other kind of pain relief. But, but the point is that we are facing an economic recession today that is a thousand times worse than anything that happened after 2008. Uh, and so this is something that we should all be very concerned about. Uh, and, and as I said, I'd love to hear what people in Brazil are finding in terms of the economic situation uh, in, in, in your country. I want to turn to another positive news. Okay, so you know the bad news. The bad news everyone knows, really, to be honest. I think all of you know this bad news. I want to really turn to the positive news and you know what the implications are for uh, reimagining and transforming mental health care. In 2009, uh, 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 2007 actually, um, the NIMH uh, invited me uh, to co-chair an NIMH task force to identify the leading research priorities in mental health. I co-chaired this task force along with Pamela Collins, who was at the time uh, uh, the chief of global mental health at NIMH. And we brought together a large group of researchers and practitioners from around the world that span all the major disciplines that are concerned with mental health, from translational neuroscience all the way through to the social sciences and public health. And using a standard Delphi approach that had been used by the Gates Foundation to establish the grand challenges in global health, we use the same approach to ask what were the chief priorities for global mental health by asking the question to our panel, what are the main challenges that need to be addressed by researchers in order for us to reduce the global burden of mental health problems? We published our findings in Nature, and this is a cover of that particular article that was published in Nature. And what really took us, perhaps not by surprise, but what took us by surprise was that even neuroscientists agreed that the most important research questions were not discovering a new circuit in the brain, 
They were not about discovering a new medication. They were not about discovering some new genetic indicator of mental health problems. They were all to do with how do we use the clinical knowledge we already have about the effective treatments, both medication as well as psychosocial interventions better. In other words, all the leading research priorities were about the delivery, the implementation of mental health care. Of course, there were important discovery questions. On the basis of this uh, uh, research priority setting exercise, many of the world's research funders began to start funding uh, implementation science in mental health, led by the NIH. Uh, the NIH now has over the last uh, uh, you know, eight or nine years funded about 12 or 13 major hubs for international mental health research. And in fact, there are, uh, there, are, there are a couple of hubs in Brazil, and maybe some of you are involved with that. I know there was a hub that involved colleagues in Rio de Janeiro. Um, there's also a hub involving colleagues in Sao Paulo. Um, and so there are many uh, NIMH hubs. There are also several other hubs in South America, you know, one in Peru, uh, et cetera. Uh, but in, they've also been funding many, many global mental health programs as part of their regular funding uh, priorities. Another major funder has been Grand Challenges Canada. Uh, and of course, the Wellcome Trust. Altogether, my calculation is about half a billion dollars has now been committed uh, towards uh, funding uh, a research that is uh, associated with priorities that we identified back in 2011 in this paper. And most of these priorities have sought to address one question. How do we deliver effective evidence-based mental health interventions in settings where there are very few services or skilled mental health providers. And friends, today, I can tell you with complete confidence that we know the answer to that question. At last count, we have at least 100 randomized control trials, at least 100, that have sought to deliver evidence-based mental health interventions in the most diverse settings in the world, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America and in Asia. So much evidence that we have now at least a dozen systematic reviews and meta-analyses, including one very good one that I would recommend you, you look at, which is from Pim Kuiper's group that was published in World Psychiatry, uh, I think last year, uh, which is the latest systematic review specifically looking at psychotherapies uh, delivered in low and middle income countries. And it's a phenomenal evidence base, really phenomenal. And it would be safe for me to say is we know how to do both prevention and clinical interventions, especially when the clinical interventions are focused on psychological and social interventions uh, in an affordable and acceptable way. And what this evidence is helping us do is to redefine the base of mental health care, the base of the pyramid. If people like us, I assume many of you on this webinar are mental health professionals, you know, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, etc. Um, we are all, I see, at the top of the pyramid. You know, we are working in a very specialist setting, in, uh, in specialist hospitals, specialist clinics, etc. Here I'm referring primarily to the base of the pyramid. This is about the large numbers of people, the 90% who do not receive minimally effective care. And for them, we are redefining mental health care in four very important respects, thanks to this very large body of delivery science. First, what does mental health care look like? You know, we as specialists have become so attuned to thinking only of clinical symptom recovery. What is very clear is that for most of our patients, symptom relief is rarely the primary concern they have. Typically, the primary concern is about function, about recovering the social functions that are so important in all our lives. Typically, their primary concerns are to do with social difficulties that they have in their life. And instead of referring people to social workers, what these interventions are showing is that a provider who is able not only to deliver clinically focused treatments, but also engage with and address social problems, at the very least by recognizing them and helping the person navigate social welfare services 
is a really crucial part of mental health care. Similarly, another what is about physical health care. We now know that many of our patients, their physical health needs are not addressed properly by their GPs. And it is us, for us as mental health providers to make sure we provide holistic person-centered care that includes addressing the medical needs of many of our patients, not necessarily by becoming medical providers, but by making sure that their medical needs are properly addressed by our colleagues in the medical system. Second, there are many more examples, and I'm, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there are many other examples of how the content of interventions is being transformed. Secondly, where? Actually, this is the most interesting thing. Mental health care can be delivered anywhere where you have a skilled provider. This can include, in my own work in India, a lot of the care is home-based. Um, you know, we deliver care at home, uh, and this is a very exciting way of reaching particularly those vulnerable and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, populations who cannot come to the clinic regularly. For example, older people who have disabilities, people who live quite far away from hospitals and clinics. And of course, now, thanks to telemedicine, uh, this is, of course, another, uh, an, another real opportunity for us to be able to deliver care uh, uh, pretty much anywhere. Not, and, and, and by anywhere, I mean beyond the mental health clinic. Who? Anyone at the base of the pyramid who is motivated and who is willing to undergo training and supervision. In our own work, this has extended to a range of different community-based providers, including community health workers, peer support workers, nurses, midwives, and so on. Remember, I'm focusing here on non-specialists, yeah? And the how? there needs to be a very important focus on the training and supervision in summary. And I'll come back to this. Um, you know, we're not training people to become mental health professionals here. We're training them to provide very specific interventions for very specific kinds of problems. We are not training psychiatrists and psychologists, but we are training a frontline army of people to provide first level care for, for example, crisis situations, acute depressive uh, episodes, acute anxiety episodes, uh, and harmful drinking. These are the kind of, and of course, trauma-related mental health problems. But only as the first line of care, and by doing so, we're increasing the coverage of the mental health care system. And to do that, we have to pay very close attention to the training. The training has to be competency-based. I often give the example of driving, you know. When we, become, when we learn how to drive a car, we don't need to learn how the car works. You know, we don't need to learn how to put a car together. We don't have to learn all those things. We just need to learn the skills to drive the car in a safe and effective way. And the driving test we do only tests that. No driving test asks you to say, if your engine breaks down, how will you fix it? And it is the same with learning mental health care. We have to strip away the unnecessary stuff and focus on the skills that people need, what we call competency-based education and quality-based supervision. Friends, I want to uh, look forward now and tell you how much impact this evidence is having uh, at the global level. About 15 years ago, if I had to say what I'm telling you now, I would have had not a single randomized control trial to support this idea. 15 years ago, nobody in the world would have accepted the idea community health workers can tr deliver mental health care. Today, everyone accepts it. By everyone, I mean the World Health Organization in the Mental Health Action Plan. This is a major independent report of the World Health Organization's independent high-level commission NCDs. I hope you can read the name of the report. You can, of course, access these um, uh, directly from the WHO website. I served on this particular high-level commission representing uh, the mental health sector. Uh, many of my colleagues were ministers and even heads of state. Um, and it was incredible to hear so many leaders of politics uh, all saying that this evidence was transformative for their countries. The World Bank, uh, this is a group that I led on behalf of the World Bank, uh, which brought together evidence across all the brain disorders, mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. And we looked at the evidence on the feasibility and cost effectiveness of scaling up these models of care. And now this is part of the World Bank's uh, uh, recommendations 
on, 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 on financing for health sector reform. And of course, many of you will know the UN SDGs uh, in which mental health is now included also with a specific commitment towards supporting mental health care in the community through a much wider range of providers than historically we actually provided. And finally, the movement for global mental health is a peer-led uh, movement. That is to say, people with a lived experience of mental illness. And this evidence, of course, is also very much in line with the idea that peers, that is people with a lived experience of mental illness, can also play a very active role as the frontline uh, first level responders for mental health care. A few years ago, Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, uh, you know, The Lancet has been the major journal that we have been publishing a lot of our work. Um, Jair was part of the first Lancet series on global mental health in 2007. Uh, a few years ago, Richard uh, invited me to assemble a, a, a new group of people working around the world um, uh, to put together a, a, a commission that looked at the recognition of mental health and the SDGs of the United Nations of what would be the kind of mission and recommendations that we had based on this new evidence that could inform a transformative agenda for mental health care. And so our first very ambitious goal was that we needed to look beyond simply access to good quality care, as important as that was, and we needed, like our colleagues in cardiovascular disease and cancer and so on, to actually say we needed to, in fact, reduce the global burden of suffering due to mental health problems. The actual incidence and prevalence of mental health problems needed to go down, and never before has that been as important as it is today. We spent many years, 28 of us together, uh, to pulling together all the evidence that had emerged since 2007. So the focus was really on evidence in the 10 years before the commission was published in 2018. It was actually launched by the then British Prime Minister Theresa May in her house, in fact, in 10 Downing Street. Um, uh, and what, what I'm going to present to you are just the, the headline, headline findings of this, of this work. Again, this particular report is available free uh, from the Lancet website. What were the key principles of the transformation of a mental health care system? The first thing, of course, uh, I, you know, I say this because many, con you know, in, in very often we, when we use the word global health, I'll be honest with you, people think it's about countries like Brazil and India. Uh, actually, global mental health applies to all countries, and the U.S. and Western Europe are no exception. Because even these countries, as I showed you earlier, haven't done that well when it comes to mental health care. And so in many ways, global mental health is the true global health subject because all countries are developing when it comes to mental health care. I, I, and I'm going to come back to this. Something really, I, I want to really tell you something at the end of my talk about something really exciting that's happening in the U.S. that is showing how the world's richest country is adopting practices from some of the world's poorest countries. Secondly, we need to look beyond the binary. In this commission, we make a very emphatic statement that the binary focus on mental health care that provides care to people who meet diagnostic criteria and ignores all the rest is not the correct way of addressing mental health problems because mental health problems lie on a dimension. And what we need is a more staged approach to mental health care. Thirdly, we need to go beyond treatments that focus only on narrow clinical interventions to look at comprehensive person-centered psychological and social care. We need to add the quality and prevention gaps to address the global burden of mental disorders, which means we need to also look at early childhood adversities, for example, and also the quality of care that is de delivered by, uh, by, by healthcare professionals across the whole spectrum. We need to emphasize actions across the life course, especially focusing on young people, because this is when most mental health problems emerge. Unfortunately, most of us don't work with adolescents. You know, only one out of 10 mental health professionals work with adolescents. And this is, of course, paradoxical, because adolescents pivot towards addressing uh, mental health in young people much more than we have historically. We need to empower people with a lived experience of mental health problems to be bang in the center of all decisions that are made in terms of the quality of care they receive, and particularly from a rights-based perspective, to work towards the reduction and ultimately the elimination 
of all coercive practices in mental health care. So like some of the images I showed you earlier should be completely abolished as soon as we possibly can from the landscape of mental health care. And we need to scale up innovative strategies to address the various supply and demand side barriers for mental health care. And what are those innovations? There were four that we identified. We grouped them together. Obviously, there were many examples. We identified four major themes of innovations. Firstly, the frontline system of mental health care should consist of non-specialist community-based providers delivering psychosocial interventions. Secondly, then we need to leverage digital tools as much as we possibly can. And we couldn't have anticipated it was COVID-19. Now that's become so much more relevant. But the digital tools I want to specify is not just for patients to help themselves. You know, that's typically what we think of in digital tools. But here by digital tools, we mean digital tools also for providers to build the work, uh, workforce, uh, to strengthen the healthcare system in addition, of course, to digital tools for the affected person. And there are so many examples of digital tools that we provide in the report. Thirdly, we need to recognize that one size does not fit all. There will be people with mental health problems who need specialist care. A minority may even need hospital care. And what we need is a balanced care model, something that Graham Thornycroft has written a lot about, so that we can really address the dimensional nature of mental health problems rather than have an all or none approach that uses just a binary diagnosis. And fourthly, very important, of course, community engagement, particularly uh, for people with the lived experience to increase demand and accountability for mental health problems. I want to end now by telling you about what I'm up to, um, you know, uh, with this agenda uh, already set, how am I in my current work uh, trying to actually um, uh, address these priorities. I joined Harvard Medical School in April 2017. You know, before this, I was working at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for 17 years. Uh, and when I joined Harvard Medical School, it was clear to me that what I really wanted to do was to bring together the incredible range of scholarship um, in the university, which has been the home of so many innovations uh, from Ron Kessler's work on World Mental Health Surveys to Arthur Kleinman's work on the social determinants of mental illness and so many more. Many of you, I'm sure, will know uh, many of the great thinkers and scholars at Harvard uh, University, not just the medical school, but the School of Public Health uh, and many other uh, uh, faculties in the university. And it's been a terrific ride. We launched Global Mental Health at Harvard as a cross-university initiative a year after I joined. And this initiative brings together hundreds of faculty from around the university and the affiliated hospitals, the departments of psychiatry and psychology, uh, to work towards a range of different specific uh, work streams that are seeking to achieve the goals that were set out by the Lancet Commission. As we say on the top, catalyze, inspire, and innovate for mental health. So it's not so much a research program, you know, Harvard has many, many different research groups already, um, but it's much more about putting this research knowledge into practice uh, at a national and a, and a global scale. And I want to end by telling you about one such initiative that I am personally involved with and leading uh, and which I, 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 I is taking up a lot of my time and something I'm very passionate about. And hopefully in the last half hour of this webinar, we can look at perhaps how, what relevance this might have for you in Brazil. And that is the Empower Initiative. The Empower Initiative is essentially a digital initiative. But unlike what I said earlier, this is not intended, in fact, for patients. It is intended for the health system to build the workforce at the base of the pyramid, to build the workforce so that we can rapidly scale up evidence-based and quality-assured psychological treatments through frontline workers. Now, let me explain to you why we need this. We have more than 100 randomized controlled trials. Nothing has gone to scale. Why is that? It's for two major reasons. The first is because the models that are used in randomized control trials for competency-based training rely on a workshop model. We have to bring people into a classroom. And we have to then get an expert to come and train those people. Now imagine in a country like India with 1.3 billion people, to try and do this to scale would take 100 years because to find the expert, and to find the time to train so many 
least hundreds of thousands of work mat led by experts. And the next barrier is quality assurance. We all know that task-based learning requires continuing quality assurance. Again, in the scientific trials, that has typically been done as a research exercise by experts in the treatment reviewing treatment sessions and rating the quality of that treatment. You can't scale that up. And so what we have been looking at is alternative approaches to training and quality assurance. And over the last five years, there's a new implementation science that's been building up that demonstrates that carefully designed, digitally delivered training programs that are competency focused are as good as orthodox face-to-face -face workshop based learning, especially if there is coaching involved. If there is a coach, in fact, it is not only as good as, it is even better than the face-to-face -face learning, not least because the training curriculum remains with you forever. You can always keep going back to revise. And of course, it's a lot cheaper. And imagine this for a moment. If I can cr create a great curriculum for a psychotherapy for depression, which is what we've done, and I'll show you that in a moment, you can scale that up in that language instantaneously within a matter of weeks. So for example, we have a curriculum now in Hindi, which is the, one of the major languages of India. That means I can scale up that curriculum for frontline workers to address about 400 million people in India within the matter of months, because it requires no additional funding, except for the coach, which is a very small cost. The second innovation has been peer supervision. That is to say that once a provider is competent, they can actually supervise one another. And on digital platforms, you can do that very much like what we're doing right now in this Zoom call by collecting from any site you're in to listen to audio recorded sessions and rating them. And we're also hoping to use a much more sophisticated computer uh, uh, machine learning based methods like natural language processing to be able to automate coding of therapy sessions. So now that we have this evidence, Empower is seeking to actually bring this evidence together into a comprehensive set of tools that can be used to help providers how to learn evidence-based treatments. I want to just specify here by evidence-based, I mean that these are treatments that have already been evaluated in randomized control trials, preferably in two different locations, that they are manualized, that they are non-proprietal, which means that they're free, and that the trials were done in routine care settings and the delivery was done by non-specialist providers. Only those treatments that meet those criteria, and we have an international science council that looks at the evidence, only those treatments enter Empower. So Empower is not intended to actually generate new treatments. Empower is intended to scale up established treatments. So what we then do is we, did, we we're using a very systematic methodology, which I won't go into details. We've got NIMH support that has helped us develop a systematic methodology that can go from a manual, establish the competencies for the delivery of the treatment, and then to convert that blueprint into a set of digital lessons that, you know, like, like any other course, it follows a, 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 you know, a sequence of lessons like you might do in a workshop. We've also had NIMH support to develop a, a methodology to design competency assessments that are valid, that can help distinguish those who have learned the treatment and know how to deliver the treatment. Uh, and, and so those competency tests are then given at the end of completing the training. Now, once people complete training, obviously you and I know it's like driving again. You know, you can go to a driving school, but that doesn't make you a great driver. The only way you really become a good driver is by driving. Um, and, uh, and so we then have a period of internship involving supervision, again, by an expert coach. Uh, and after you complete a minimum a number of cases with a minimum quality, and we also now have quality metrics. These are numerical metrics that can be applied uh, to therapy sessions, all of which is done, by the way, online. You can then graduate from being a trainee to becoming a full-fledged provider, uh, which includes then remote delivery on telemedicine platforms. And as you learn more and more treatments, you can also be learning skills of decision support for matching. The final set, we've already started working on all of these, by the way. Uh, the final set, of course, is once you train 
large numbers of providers. Say, for example, I was working in a state in, in the US, which I am in Texas. Uh, what we then have, if once we train a thousand providers, all the data from those providers on the work they're doing is linked to patient outcomes. And here's the really exciting thing here. You can start then using data science to begin to understand which components of quality actually predict the best patient outcome. Something we've never been able to do in our field, which is to say to use data science for precision allocation of specific ingredients of the complex psychosocial interventions uh, that we deliver. Friends, this is not just a pipe dream. We already have uh, started work on this. Um, uh, oh, many, many years ago, I uh, received funding from the Wellcome Trust to develop a six session behavioral activation treatment for severe depression. Our randomized control trials were published in the Lancet and PLOS Medicine. And these were then replicated uh, in a trial in, um, uh, in Nepal. And it, 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 it attracted a lot of attention. Uh, 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 soon after that, uh, PICORI, which is a major U.S. government funding agency which funds effectiveness studies for uh, the U.S., uh, funded a $14 million grant to take this very treatment and adapt it for mothers with depression in the U.S. and Canada and to deliver the treatment in the hand of nurses uh, and compare that with specialist providers and also telemedicine compared with face-to-face. -face. And that trial is ongoing right now, obviously, uh, it's partly come to a halt because of COVID, uh, but it gives you a sense of the amount of traction these brief treatments are getting even in rich countries. We have over the last few years with NIMH support working with a grassroots agency in India uh, called Sangat, converted it into an app that can be used by frontline workers. So the whole treat uh, learning of the treatment has been fully digitized um, and is now uh, available for frontline workers in 16 lessons or modules that they have to follow in sequence. We also have this available offline because in India and rural parts of the country, uh, the internet is very poor. And so it's also available completely as an offline version if, uh, if the person doesn't have good, good access. We are now using this methodology uh, to adapt the curriculum for delivery in the US. And isn't that amazing? Um, you know, the US and Canada, the richest countries in the world are using treatments that were developed in India uh, to scale up mental health care uh, in, in, in the US. Uh, the first um, uh, implementation rollout is going to happen in Texas. We already have funding from the Surgo Foundation to adapt the curriculum. Uh, it's, I call this reverse engineering, right? We, we've got a curriculum that's in Hindi and developed for Indian workers. It's now being ad adapted by the American Psychological Association uh, and Harvard University colleagues of mine in my department uh, for delivery uh, in Texas to frontline by frontline providers. Uh, we're also seeking funds uh, from the Gates Foundation uh, to develop a, a similar curricula for maternal depression using an evidence-based brief uh, intervention of 10 sessions called the Thinking Healthy Program that's been approved by the WHO. And we're also, because of COVID-19, uh, in, in an advanced stage of application for funding to rapidly digitize curricula for basic psychosocial skills for frontline workers who are doing contact tracing and doing the COVID-19 containment uh, 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 strategies, both for self-care, this is the Self-Help Plus Guide, uh, as well as for acute crisis counseling uh, for, um, uh, for, for people who are uh, in the community. Uh, these are both WHO interventions, um, uh, which have been also meeting our criteria of meeting uh, the randomized control trials. I'm coming to the end now. <clears throat> Basically, um, friends, what this will do for us in both India and the US, so we're rolling this out in the India and US right now. Um, and I just wanted to say this, is, this, this kind of approach can be done by any, in any country of the world. Um, uh, this is being done by Harvard Medical School. It is a non-for-profit uh, enterprise. Um, and essentially, any partner uh, that we have uh, would have to raise their own resources to actually adapt these particular approaches for their language or their, their context. But what we're going to do in Texas and India is simply this. We will be working with a large and growing number of community-based providers who will undergo training on, the, on their phones, will complete an exam so they become a competent provider. Those who are uh, successful will then go on to become a, uh, 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 this is a competent learner, will then go on for case-based learning, uh, which is actually seeing cases and being supervised until they achieve a basic quality standard, after which they become accredited uh, and, and become a, a regular providers. After one or two years of service, we will expect that these providers will in fact become experts themselves because the best experts are those who treat, treat patients and can then actually go on 
and provide expert supervision. So you can see there is an actual uh, sustainability cycle here that after the initial investment of a year or two, you will then have a continuing cycle of people who will be able to provide supervision and quality assurance. And so the impact is like this. There's a rising demand thanks to COVID-19. Right now in India and the US, there is a very limited supply of mental health professionals. And so the number of people who are gonna be helped is very small. With Empower, we're not replacing these. We're just expanding the footprint of mental health care so that we can help a lot more people uh, than we are currently able to do. In closing, friends, uh, I, you know, my, the title of my talk was uh, Transforming uh, Mental Health Care. I think um, what I see this enormous body of science that has come from some of the world's poorest countries as offering a historic opportunity for us to invest in and transform the mental health care system. While we certainly need more money, there's no question about it, mental health care has been the stepchild of all healthcare systems around the world. I think it's really important for us to make sure we're not just pouring all that money into the same old system. Because if we do that, we will have what has happened in the US, which is that we have a very top heavy system, which is sucking in money, but it doesn't really have the kind of impact that we should be seeing with that kind of spending. We need to also strengthen the base of the mental health care system. And to do that, we need to be guided by the best science. My last sentence really speaks very much for what I see in the US and India. I don't know what it's like in Brazil, and I hope that we can now co talk about that. In India and the US, even the, even the money that we're spending is always being spent on a very narrow set of approaches on mental health care. Mental health care must go beyond that. It must embrace the diversity of experiences and interventions beyond the emphasis on doctors, diagnoses, and drugs, the 3Ds, so that ultimately, we can live in a world where everyone has access to effective mental health care. Thank you. Uh, I will stop there, uh, Jair, uh, and hand back to you to help moderate any, any questions and discussion you might have. Well, Vikram, thank you very much about your invitation, accepting the invitation, being with us. It's a great pleasure. You have always been really an inspiration for all the global mental health professionals. And again, you know, you've been in Harvard, it's a privilege to have your, uh, you know, in this position of defending and supporting mental health globally and uh, giving, you know, ideas and uh, guidelines about how things really could change and make, and make mental health more uh, affordable and uh, more increasing uh, the coverage for, for the people we really need. And, uh, you know, the situation here, well, this, this paper by Gray and Tony Croft is not so different. You know, many people with depression in cities like Sao Paulo and Rio, they have no access to treatment. Around 10 to 15 percent only of people with depression would get a proper uh, treatment. We also have people in jails, a lot of, you know, mental uh, with people with psychiatric disorders in jails, we, we have some surveys on that, and we have no programs on that. We improve a lot in, you know, in breaking the asylum, but still we have to do a lot, for sure. And the pandemic is also bringing to us the opportunity of telemedicine, training more psychologists. We know, you know, the situation here is going to be about the same. I've been writing about, you know, the worst of the pandemic will happen in mental health. You know, it's very likely that we will have a, 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 a real increase in many psychiatric conditions. This will bring remote delivery a very important tool of inclusion. So I would say nowadays we don't need only sanitary inclusion, we really need digital 
inclusion because this could be a way of reaching people and we have to really uh, trying to support and advocate for uh, improving access to digital uh, technologies for everybody. And uh, the same with the community services now, they will have to be more assertive, particularly now that we don't know what's going to happen in the future. You know, you cannot just stand in there with the professionals. You have to really to keep in touch with these people, what's happening with them, what sort of treatments they are getting, so we need really to invent mental health. And uh, so I thank you again for uh, this opportunity to have having you. And Paul well, Vikram, I have one question. What about loneliness? I mean, it's incredible how loneliness has been something, an object of study, you know, talking about this spectrum of emotions and feelings, and uh, we see how this important it can be in developed societies where you have everything, but you don't have the happiness, you know, and this is the beginning of probably of a depression, a suicide, and unhappiness. So I would like you to comment a little bit on that and I will open for people, uh, for questions they can raise to you. Thanks so much, Richard, to be with us. Yeah, thank you, Jair. You know, what you asked is a very difficult question. I, I don't know whether I have a straight answer to that. But I can tell you, um, you know, I, speaking from my position in the US, um, you know, our mental health is so profoundly affected by what is happening in the world around us, you know, um, you know, I, 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 and it's reached almost a, a, a situation in the US right now. I, I'm sure many of you have saw Michelle Obama's um, disclosure uh, that she is uh, suffering from uh, depression. And, I, and, you know, I think it's, it's reached a point where actually it's almost becoming um, uh, an epidemic of its own. I hate to use that word epidemic, you know, because it's, uh, you know, because of, for obvious reasons. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it, it's, it is a complex question. To what extent are clinical interventions going to be, uh, what is the place of clinical interventions at a time like this? Um, I'm often asked this question, you know, if, if, if the whole economy has collapsed, there is violence in the streets. Um, there is such complete breakdown of trust between people. Um, there is a complete polarization of people according to who they vote for, etc. What is the role of clinical interventions in this? You know, uh, and I think you know, my, I, I struggle sometimes with the, with the, with how to respond. But what I really say is that it's not a question of one or the other. We must always stand in solidarity for a peaceful and just society. There is no question that that is a very important goal. But this is not going to be within our reach right now. And we are not, as individuals, able to create that just society alone. But what we can do right now is to help that what we are trying to address has a much larger social determinant attached to it. It's really important not only to use the biology track because you know, I think what that does is in picky disconnected from reality. Um, we have to acknowledge that the biology of our brains is responding to the stresses in the social world and that we have to address the social determinants um, as much as the individual clinical consequences uh, of those stressful circumstances. And I'm finding, you know, uh, uh, Jair, that there's a lot more people interested in mental health than ever before. You and I have been, like many others on this call, have been involved with mental health care for you know, 30 years. I have never seen a moment in history where presidents and prime ministers, when UN secretary generals, head of every agency from UNICEF, to wherever you go, everyone is speaking about mental health. And I think this is a real opportunity for the community of professionals that we represent to reach out, not close our doors, but to listen, to understand, and instead of holding power, to give up some power, to become part of the solution rather than to become the problem. I, I, you know, many of us work with WPA, and I know under Helen Herman's leadership, 
The WPS played a really positive role in reaching out to other sectors. And I think this is so important at the national level as well, uh, that psychiatric associations and, uh, and, 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 and practitioners are opening our minds and reaching out and working with people outside the mental health sector as equal partners, not just, you know, because we do work with them, but we work in a, in a, in a hierarchy, you know, we are the boss. And I think we have to learn to, to work, I think, in a much more uh, equal participation uh, way with people. I do that a lot in India. And I have to say, I found that is the most appropriate strategy for a country like India. You know, we have only 4,000 psychiatrists for 1.3 billion people. You can do the maths. It's, you know, it's a ridiculously small number. Uh, and I think the only way we can get mental health care out is by working in partnership. There's no other way of doing it. Vikram, there are some questions here. I'm going to talk to you about a question made by a professor in infant uh, adolescence. Jai, Jai, uh, you're, 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 you, can you speak a little closer to your microphone? I, for some reason, it, you, your voice is not all that clear. It's a little soft. Okay. Can you hear me now yes, better? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, cool, cool. There is a question from, from Professor uh, Sheila Caetano. She is asking you, any specific program that address mental health for adolescents? Would you like to know about the psychosocial interventions by mental health providers in the primary care? Are medication practice and physical activities included? Uh, that those are the questions. Okay. Peter, did you do anything for infant psychiatry? And uh, what about you know interventions like meditations and physical activity? What what have you done for infant and adolescent? So I, 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 I'll answer some. I can't answer all, but I'll, uh, let me go with adolescents. So the main interventions for adolescents at the base of the pyramid, remember, I'm always talking about the population here, is uh, interventions that are school-based uh, and that are intended to build skills, particularly for emotional regulation. Uh, and the most uh, common uh, techniques are problem solving. Um, in, in some places, mindfulness is being used, um, but they all have the same fundamental mechanism which is to improve emotional regulation, particularly in adolescence. This is a very important driver of mental health problems, is impulsivity and emotional dysregulation. And so the idea is you have interventions that build the skills uh, for, you know, for reducing impulsive behaviors uh, and, and improving emotional regulation. The second is for younger uh, uh, people, you know, the main interventions are with families. Uh, parenting interventions, but you know, but that is not easy to do uh, right now, especially you know because uh, of the whole COVID-19. But there is a there is a good evidence base on on parenting interventions. Now we do not give medication through non-specialized providers. Okay, um, uh, so medication is outside. Uh, uh, you know, it's not. It, they're, they're not licensed to give medication. This is. There are exceptions to this, like in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there is a completely special uh, a healthcare worker called a uh, nurse officer, nurse practitioner. Um, and this is a nurse who undergoes an extra amount of training to learn to prescribe some basic psychotropic drugs that includes antidepressants. Also for continuation medication. So they may not be able to start an antipsychotic uh, medication uh, or anticonvulsant, but they can continue it. Um, and so there are different models in different countries. In my own work, we've not never done task sharing or medication. It's too risky, I think. Um, you know, uh, and so we only allow medication to be used by the medical professions. Um, that could include primary care professions or doctors uh, for antidepressants. But for antipsychotics and anticonvulsants, our policy is that everyone should be assessed by a psychiatrist first. Um, and that continuing care can be done through remote support uh, in primary care or te now with telemedicine, of course, you can do it even direct to the patient. Uh, but the diagnosis and initiation of antipsychotic and anticonvulsant drugs or mood stabilizers uh, would never be done in primary care. It would always be done in specialist care. But continuing care for well-maintained patients uh, will be decentralized through a collaborative care framework uh, to primary care doctors. 
Um, so all our work, um, the, you know, is really around psychological and social interventions, which, to be quite honest, is what 90% of people with mental health problems need. Uh, you know, those, those who don't come to us are the ones who really need basically psychological and social interventions. Um, and, uh, and that is really what the focus of much of this global health work is around, is the patients who are not being able to access uh, a specialist care. Vikram, uh, I'm going to open a question for Cleusa, Cleusa Perry. Hi, Vikram. I couldn't, I couldn't hold, you know, I, need, I needed to talk to you. <laughs> it was very nice to see you. Thank you very much. It was always, as always, a very, very great presentation, very inspirational. Um, and I just would like—I I just would like to come back to what you were saying before. You know, this moment that we are living, and how uh, it's a good moment. Or it's a horrible moment. Terrible circumstances, but at a time where health has been um, being the media and uh, much more uh, awareness about uh, uh, attention to to the to the health in general, but especially to the mental health. And I, I really think that this may be an opportunity for us to scale up few few things that we might um, have in mind. My que my question to you is um, how you know I always have it is difficult on on the global when you think global mental health, uh, thinking that countries are so different, and even countries like in India and Brazil so different within the countries. You know we have such. A different reality between Amazons and Sao Paulo within Brazil and and how we these projects you know I always get uh, some of the the global initiatives they are very much uh, um, uh, some of them are very like one thing for all and it doesn't take into account all these difference and uh, my question to you is about empower. And I think several things. I think it's very interesting. I really like the idea. Definitely something that can scale up. Uh, how it, this would be, you know, I imagine that whatever the country is going to join you on this adventure is definitely uh, have to take into account the, 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 the health system, uh, the, how you get involved, maybe the politicians who make decisions, um, because we, one thing is doing research, isn't it? Like we do lots of research and then how you can put that impact in so many different realities. It's more, it's more a reflection because I am always uh, having difficult uh, to get all these global initiatives and make them work well in most of the places that, uh, you know, that we people live in. Yeah, Cluza, you know, this is a big, it's a real challenge, right? I mean, um, it's a tension. Here's the tension as I see it. In psychiatry, in mental health care, we have been trained to look at the individual as a unique person with a very unique life story, uh, a very unique set of social circumstances. And, and, and you know, good, good psychiatrists will always personalize the care for that individual. So that's, that's the classic model of psychiatric care. And, you know, in many ways, if you look at the old forms of psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, highly personal, you know, there is no package that you give to everyone. On the other hand, you have this huge challenge um, that we want to be a medical profession and medical and the rest of medicine is all based on algorithms and guidelines and, and, and recommendations and packages. There is an inherent tension here, right? Uh, there's an inherent tension about our identity. And I would say with Empower, the way we've tried to navigate this is to make it very clear that the only thing that is global are the principles, the mechanistic principles of a treatment. I actually have to tell you, Clusa, I don't think Brazilians in Amazonas and in, um, in Sao Paulo are any different when it comes to the way their minds react to stress. What is different is the language, the context, the cultural connection with mental health care, and obviously, uh, those are issues that must be taken into account when you adapt any treatment for delivery. Otherwise, you'll have no one coming for the treatment. Uh, you know, if you want a treatment that is acceptable, that people come for and people engage with and complete, it has to be presented in a way that is going to be accessible to them. And that is essential for all interventions in our, in our sector. So I would agree with you. It cannot be a one-size-fits-all. But what we need to agree is, 
that there is a fundamental mechanism of mental ill health and nothing I have seen in the science suggests that people in different parts of the world have different brains when it comes to the way that their, their experiences of mental ill health differ. I have not seen any evidence of that. Um, what I have seen evidence of is that cultural and contextual factors profoundly influence the engagement of people with the mental health care system. And that is something that we must make sure we address. So for example, with Empower, when we, I already told you, you know, we've got this intervention, it was developed in India. We're spending six months adapting it for the US. And this is involves co-production with, uh, you know, frontline workers in the US, with patients with depression, changing some of the words, the metaphors, language, the scenarios, a whole lot of things will, are, are gonna change. But we have to do that. Otherwise, we will build a program that will not have anyone, uh, you know, we will not have any takers in the US. And we will do the same wherever we go. Thank you. And Cruz, they're very nice to see you again after so long. Yes. Are, are, you, are you in Brazil? Yes, I am in Brazil in the, the same department as Jair. And uh -huh. you look very well, you didn't get, you didn't get old. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Vikram, our last question. Let me tell you, we have 220 people, 220 people uh, missing to you, but I'm sure we are going to translate this talk. And, uh, you know, if it were in Portuguese, for sure, there would be more people interested. So the, the last question is for, from Laura Feitosa. She wants to know, there is any data about the difference of impact of adolescent school interventions between United States considering the marijuana liberation laws, how liberation of marijuana did affect uh, mental health in schools. Do you have anything on that? Well, there's some, some, some information is emerging on the impact of legalization of marijuana on a variety of different health outcomes, one of which has just been published on road traffic injuries uh, and accidents. Um, so it's important to remember that officially, at least, marijuana is illegal if uh, under the age of 21. Um, so it, 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 you know, officially, it may be legalized, but it's like alcohol. It's, it's, um, the, there are very strict uh, limits as to um, the age of people who can buy marijuana. Uh, and, um, and so there is actually a very big black market that's still there. You know, there is a very big drug market for marijuana even now because, uh, you know, obviously um, that's the only way that adolescents can get hold of it. So I don't think the legalization of marijuana has directly contributed at the moment to adolescent marijuana use because it's illegal for them, just as it was before. Where you're seeing an impact is for uh, those who are adults. And there are two kinds of evidence that are emerging. One of them is acute psychotic episodes. And so there is now a, a, a evidence base, certainly in Boston, in hospitals like MassGen, of the numbers of individuals who are being brought to accident and emergency in acute psychotic states. Um, and, and the second is car accidents. Um, and I'll tell you what, unless there is a, a rapid, uh, a, you know, a correction of this, uh, they, they will, the pendulum will go back. This is my prediction. Uh, at some stage, the pendulum will swing back, especially if these acute psychotic states um, grow in number. Uh, and the reason uh, is very obvious that this is not marijuana that has grown on the hillside. Um, you know, this is not the marijuana that people smoked 100 years ago. Uh, this is marijuana that's grown in a lab. Um, you know, it, it's the same difference like between crack cocaine and coca leaves, you know, there's no, there's nothing, there's nothing similar between that. I remember when I, when I went to Peru many years ago, I was walking the Inca trail and everyone with me was chewing these coca leaves. And I thought they were, you know, I was wondering what the hell is going on here. But actually I tried many of those coca leaves I, you know, I, I felt like a goat. Uh, you know, it, it, it didn't do anything to me, um, except it gave me a little buzz, but that was it. That is what the old marijuana used to be, you know, it was basically a wild plant. Whereas what you're getting in the US today is completely hybridized. There is nothing natural about it anymore. And I think this is the real danger is that big companies have gone into the marijuana business. And we are going to see, a, uh, my, my own prediction is, we're going to see a lot of mental health consequences 
in, in the months and years ahead. And, um, and that, that's because these are very toxic uh, levels of THC uh, in, in, in the marijuana that's being used in the US now. Vikram, last question. I'm going to say to Carmen. Dr. Carmen Diana. Carmia. Carmen, you're not mute, you're muted. Carmen, you're muted. Sorry. Nice to see you again, Vic. Very nice to hear your always inspiring talk. And uh, it's really nice to see you and see so many friends in this small, uh, in, in this small uh, pictures. Uh, one thing that I would like to comment on is uh, that with this new, con I, I mean, we have a very violent country here and I'm sure in India you have high rates of violence too. And this COVID business has uh, increased some forms of violence. I mean, uh, self-harm, for instance, uh, uh, although we, had, we have a, a, a lower, a drop in the, in the notification of uh, suicide attempts, we have an expected increase in suicide deaths by 30% by now, although the numbers are still not available. And we have a very high increase uh, in domestic violence, uh, household violence, affecting obviously children and especially women. And all these are very much related to, uh, to mental health issues, bidirectionally, uh, as we know. And uh, I was wondering, I mean, because uh, preventing or treating, addressing mental health uh, problems, uh, in the population, I mean, the, uh, in the basis, as you said, uh, I mean, how how could we how could we uh, match it with addressing uh, violence prevention or exposure to violence, uh, especially uh, among children? And I mean, obviously, we have urban violence, homicide rates, feminicide, as you know, Brazil has a right. But I mean, how, how can we sort of uh, put together those things that are very much caring for the population, for the yeah, general I, population? So, Carmen, you know, it's great to see you as well. And, you know, it, it, this is a big question. Hopefully, we can connect also separately. But let me just give you a quick answer in the time that we have left. You know, this is an example of how the COVID-19 policies have really failed in many ways the larger population. I, I believe very strongly that the way that uh, the focus has been only on controlling the virus, but not the consequences of policies on people's everyday lives has been a fundamental failure of governance. Um, so for example, what you described, the rise of domestic violence, the fact that children are now being trapped in homes, often very oppressive environments, that they are not getting, not just the learning environment, actually children go to school in many parts of the world because that's where they get their best meal of the day. Um, mm -hmm. Children go to school because they often escape very stressful home environments. Sure. But also in the more positive sense, children go to school because they learn from other children how to behave, how to, how to you know, emotionally regulate and so on. And so this whole question of school closure, it's interesting, just today, there are, the WHO has finally announced that the reopening of schools is a priority. But actually, it really strikes me as such an, it's, it's become a politically divisive issue, right? And it should not be. It should, this is not about politics. This is not about whether you believe in this president or that president. Sure. It, it's about our children at the center of your public policy making. And they're not. The whole thing has become about which political ideology you follow. And this is a great big tragedy in many countries. So, and the second is women's issues. This is now obvious around the world that this lockdown has affected women and children disproportionately in terms of the risk of violence. But we could have predicted this. This is not, it's not like as if this is, oh my God, it happened. You know, it's like who was actually thinking when you announced these policies? Did you put into place the telephone <laughs> helpline, did you get the police and social workers empowered to be able to interact quickly, etc.? Did you have shelter homes set up for, uh, for women and children who needed to escape? 
No, it's all a need, now it's a reactive, you know, now we have to do these things. So it's a real, when, when the history of COVID-19 is finally written, I am absolutely certain that the impact of social policies to control COVID-19's impacts on other health and social issues will emerge as one of the biggest lessons uh, of, of, of this pandemic, that you should never plan such major social policies without oh, thinking of their, all, all their impacts. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you so much. I have to go, uh, uh, but it's been a real pleasure, Jair. Uh, it's been such a delight to see so many old friends, and thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, as I said, I'm really so sorry I don't speak Portuguese. I know every time I connect with your community, I feel like, a, like a, you know, I'm trying to run on one leg. But um, I, will, I will hope that uh, many of you have enjoyed my talk and look forward to connecting with you separately. Thank you so much, Vikram. We keep in touch. Okay, of course. Man. See you. Bye-bye. Cheers.